record to do that. Um, thank you all for this discussion. And thank you to Jamie. That was a really excellent presentation. I didn't know as much about your program, so I'm glad that I got to, to learn a little bit more about it. Um, do you all have your discussion group, discussion guides in front of you? Mm -hmm. Um, so we have basically four uh, categories of issues. One is definitions and guidelines. One is engaging, educating family caregivers. One is about providers, emergency respite providers. And the last one is about important partnerships um, that might help facilitate implementation of an emergency voucher program. So I don't know if you all have a preference for what you might want to focus in on. Anybody have a preference to start? I sort of like the idea of guiding. Wasn't there something about guiding um, providers or caregivers? There's what about, uh, yeah, engaging and educating family caregivers um, mm -hmm. about using these emergency vouchers. Let's start with that. And then if we have time, um, I personally am always intrigued by the availability of providers when we're talking about emergency respite uh, because so many of our traditional respite agencies will not take people on an emergency basis at all. Um, and that can, if they don't have their own social support network, that can be a really huge barrier um, to getting emergency respite. But the first question under um, educating family caregivers, and this is just a really broad question, but what do you all see as the primary barriers uh, for family caregivers in seeking and using emergency respite vouchers that might be different from just using a planned voucher? This is Jamie. I think what we've um, come to realize, one, the workforce uh, right now is so limited and so um, even trying to get a provider to come out there on an emergency basis has been an absolute challenge. Um, we've been, um, we try to dig deep to kind of help um, and identify maybe some um, family members or friends or somebody that they can actually connect with because all of these different agencies, the availability is so limited or it could be super expensive. Um, because of the limitation of the, the providers out there. So that, that goes right back to the provider issue, that, the second yeah. issue that I was most interested in. Anybody else see other barriers around emergency respite for family caregivers? We don't. Uh, I work on, in New York State and um, right now we're not working on an emergency respite program. Um, we have just a regular old respite program. Um, a lot of people call me up and we have a checkbox on our form that says, is, is this an emergency need? And uh, I was actually kind of surprised at how many people didn't really know how to define that. Um, they called me up and said, well, what does this really mean? And um, so a lot of times it seems to be people are going off for surgery on Friday and they need someone to come in while they're in the hospital. Yeah, that's a frequent one we get here nationally too. Some states have developed very, very specific guidelines for what is defined as emergency respite. To different, but especially if they're also running a regular planned respite voucher program to differentiate uh, between the two of funds they're going to, to draw from um, for those purposes. And I think I, I think I shared with you all some of the guidelines that other states have uh, put in place, uh, specific emergency respite guidelines for determining eligibility for those services. Was that in the email you sent, Jill? Um, yeah, I did send, I did put it in one of the emails. Um, okay, I'll look for it. Under the lifespan respite tools, states have shared what their uh, emergency respite guidelines are or have been in the past. Um, there's also the issue for family caregivers. The second question, um, if you are providing emergency respite or you'd like to provide emergency respite, do you have training for family caregivers to prepare for emergencies and to develop a plan before an emergency occurs um, 
in case they might need respite? Do they know who they might call on? Do they, um, are they, are they, have they prepared their loved one maybe for a, an emergency placement, um, if that's possible? Um, so that kind of training. We just um, awarded our innovative and exemplary uh, respite services um, awardees. And one reason we awarded it to um, one of the programs was because of an emergency respite plan that they developed with every caregiver that they work for, with. Um, before the emergency should arrive, that the, every family caregiver that comes to their service has an emergency plan. And we thought that was very interesting and unique. I was wondering if anybody else out there has something similar. We don't, but I would love to include a, a, the thought of that in my respite application voucher program, you know, so they could have something like that. Um, I wonder if that state that got that would be interested in sharing some of that. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. They'll be presenting at the national, it's not a state program, it's a nonprofit uh, okay. agency and they'll be um, presenting at the national conference. And I'll, I'll send a link around to their program and the emergency tool that they use too for yeah. planning. I and think, of course you can always use the, the life course respite tools too for planning. Some of you that are familiar yeah. with those. Um, and I bet there are other tools out there too that, that could be used. Yeah, I, I would like to start with theirs and then expand yeah. the life course and then they share that with the local uh, Alzheimer's Association and our Nevada Senior Services. I work real close with both of those organizations as well. So collaborate with them tremendously. So. Anyone else have any issues or concerns around family caregivers? Were you gonna say something, Jamie? Well, yeah, I was just going to share as far as like training, um, we are also part of that Wisconsin pilot project and that has helped us implement uh, training for the respite providers and um, we're looking to enhance that training once the pilot project is over to include that emergency planning for caregivers and their loved ones so that they can be prepared when they do have emergencies or when they have people coming in to, to provide that care for their loved ones. So we're we're excited about that, and we're hopefully can get that implemented. Yeah, wow, that's that's exciting. That's very exciting. Even just identifying who are the formal providers in your community who will provide respite on a less than twenty four hour notice. Um, yeah. there aren't too many. <laughs> One experiment that Maryland did was to, when they first initiated their emergency voucher program, was to contract with a statewide home care agency that pledged to make care providers available uh, immediately if an emergency should arise. And that, that worked well for a while, but <laughs> they ran into some problems with that approach as well. Uh, but they were thinking we can do emergency vouchers, but we also have to make sure that people have the providers once we give them the funds and they need the respite in the next day. How do we make sure they have the actual providers. Uh, that's the only state that I know of that actually contracted with people in advance to make sure those providers were available. And, you know, again, in an emergency, I think a lot of families are going to rely on their own family members, perhaps, um, to provide that care. But I would also think that family yeah. caregivers who are seeking emergency vouchers don't have that support network. That's why they're seeking the emergency care. So it is an important issue to, to think about. Um, any other educational or outreach strategies you use successfully with family caregivers to make sure they know about the emergency vouchers and are using them? I think you touched on that, Jamie, in your presentation, though. Yeah, we try to do any kind of plugins when we have the ability to, as we're talking in community meetings or any kind of meetings with other um, organizations. Um, and then we also send them out every, like, I think quarterly to our big listservs and just kind of say, hey, you know, we still have these emergency funds. And then we have like a flood referrals coming in and then they right. a little bit and then they, you know, so it's ebbs and flows on that. But we, um, I think word of mouth has helped a lot as well uh, since we've been doing these emergency funds for um, a few of our grant years um, through our ACL grant. Um, so as people start hearing about these emergency funds becoming available again, 
we have organizations, professionals, hospitals posting it up and getting the word out there um, that they're available again. So that's been um, helpful and other caregivers sometimes talk to other caregivers through support groups or, um, um, or just professionals that come across caregivers and they see that this is an urgent need of theirs, they look to us as well. So it's been, it's just kind of a little web that we've been kind of weaving in the community to kind of touch on just different um, organizations. We're now touching into our faith-based um, organizations as well. So um, we're excited for that too, to get in, in contact with them. Do all of the applicants to your emergency program have to have some sort of referral? Um, no, sometimes we, um, Yaz gets um, a phone call or an email um, straight from the caregiver and they don't know about a referral form, they just know that she can offer some kind of help. Mm. So um, we um, have kind of navigated it where if, if the caregiver is really just at their wit's end, you know, and just they can't fill out another form, it's just too much for them we just kind of do that intake or that referral form over the phone and we gather all of the information that we need to make that determination um, of getting them connected to resources or getting them connected to our funding hmm. or both right right so they don't necessarily have to fill out an application no um they do once yes gets a hold of them okay so a lot of the times, um, either other professionals or other organizations have the referral form, the application for it, and they help them fill it out and send it in. But in instances where caregivers are just calling numbers, mm. seeing if they can get connected, we just take that initiative and we have them on the phone, we have them then in there, mm -hmm. we'll just fill it out for them. That's great. Mm -hmm. Jamie, I should probably know this, but um, I don't because I'm part of the state of Nevada. But um, do the caregiver and the participant have to live in the same home or can it just be like a neighbor wat that watches continuously or? It's it's open to any of that. Okay. If they live in the home, if they don't. Okay. I wasn't 100% sure. Yeah. I think originally, I think we did do something like that where they had to, they I don't remember if they couldn't live in the home. I, I don't remember exactly, but we took that barrier out because we figured a caregiver is a caregiver and they're providing that support, whether they're living at home or outside of the home. Yeah, I saw that in our pin. So, okay, I didn't know if that expanded to you guys as well. Okay. Yeah. And an emergency is an emergency. <laughs> an emergency is an emergency. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of what helped us really broaden that out. Yeah. Yeah. We were like, you know, very, you know, structured and it's like they already have to go through all those hoops and eligibilities and all those processes through state programming, through all of this other stuff. Why are we going to make it more difficult when they're in an emergency to say, hey, you still have to jump through five more hoops to get this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we try to, if we have the ability and capability to be able to remove a lot of those barriers, then that's what we've been doing. That's great. The, the outreach question that we were talking about before too kind of leads into the last question on the discussion guide, guide and that's some of the specialized partnerships um, with maybe partners you hadn't thought about previously specifically related to emergencies like child or adult protective services, first responders, uh, I think you did say, or uh, Yaz yeah, said that in Nevada, you get referrals from hospitals, you know, mm -hmm. from the medical community, uh, abuse prevention agencies, maybe. Um, you know, those folks that deal with emergencies every day that might be able to refer people to you. Yeah, we are definitely connecting with our hospitals. We have a um, uh, We've, we've been really building out our partnership with our APS um, um, folks as well to really, you know, they can handle that emergent crisis situation that's happening and then get those people over to us, whether it be a care recipient or um, the caregiver and get them those supports and services in place. And if there's um, 
and that goes through our ADRCs. And then the ADRCs can make the determination, is there an emergent need for um, funding and then they send them. So it's almost like this, they, we can get them connected to services and then we can be one of those olive branches um, for res emergency respite services. Right. I know, is, oh, go ahead, Card. I just wanted to know that how long does it take for you guys to, I guess, fund it once the person's reached out to you? So it depends. So um, sometimes it's a really quick turnaround for you guys, depending on the situation. If it's like something where um, we had somebody that was taking care of their daughter that was on life support. Um, her husband had died from COVID um, at the end of last year. Her daughter was on life support. A hot and No, I think she was just on life support. And she wasn't working. She was undocumented. Um, her lights were going to be shut off if she didn't pay in the next, like, I think it was like two or three days. When we assessed that at that initial phone call, um, we just asked her, like, us, you know, just that, you know, shut off bill, we can get that paid, we'll make that payment directly over there and get that going. And then we then just figure out ways to get them connected to other resources as well. So it could be a fast turnaround. We've had um, some turnarounds where it is in home respite services that are needed in the home for a surgery or something like that. And they just have nobody or they don't want to ask their family for more help without giving them some kind of payment. So we um, schedule that out, they do the timesheet, they pay, and then we do the reimbursement. Um, and so then that way we reimburse them for that. Um, and we, so we try to see what is happening in that situation. So it, it could be fairly quickly or it could be a couple of weeks. There's been some cases where we're trying to get them to get sustainable or somewhat sustainable so that we can say, this is not gonna be a Band-Aid. Um, and once we get them there, it could be, I would say, I would say anywhere between sometimes four weeks or so. Um, but we really have those conversations. We try to get them connected and, and, and just kind of see what we can provide them um, and see if, if this is a good, um, benefit for them to use these buttons. We only have uh, two less than two minutes left. I wanted Marsha to maybe have a chance to introduce herself and Amber and let us know what state you're from and if you've got an emergency program going in your state. Yes, hello, I'm Marsha Cooper and I recently began assisting with the um, lifespan respite program and we do have an emergency voucher program um, I've just been involved for the past couple of weeks. So this is just I'm really a up. learning, learning um, experience it? for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what state are you from? Mississippi. Mississippi, great, wonderful. Yes. I'm glad you're here, welcome. Thank you. And Amber, I think you're from New York, aren't you? Yes, hi everyone. Um, I'm Amber Goodrich. I'm from the New York State Office for the Aging. Um, we're in the, uh, process of expanding our caregiver directed program, um, which will um, have an emergency respite aspect of it. So definitely still in the, the learning stages as well. So this has been a very helpful discussion. So thanks everyone. Well, thank you all. This is really a great group. I like that it's only five or six people can really chat with each other. <laughs> um, we should be going back in about 30 seconds. Any last minute comments from anybody? You got 20 seconds. <laughs> yes, thank you for the opportunity to have the discussion with us. And this is great to learn from each other. Yeah, thank you all so much for participating in this today. And Jamie, we'll real quick, if you need help um, connecting to some of the first responders down in the Vegas Valley, I, I have contacts at all of them. Okay. And some of the police departments. Let's connect. You know how to get a hold of me. <laughs> yes. Yay, connections. Yes. All right, we'll see you back out. Bye.